I ran blindly for perhaps a mile altogether, my chest straining, my heart beating in my ears. And then, hearing nothing of Montgomery or his man Maling, and feeling upon the verge of exhaustion, I lay down in the shelter of a canebrake. There I remained for a long time, too fearful to move. And suddenly I heard a staghound bay, and at that realized a new danger. Stumbling upon the lip of a long creek, I went straight into the water. I scrambled out at last on the westward bank and crept into a tangle of ferns to await the issue. The minutes passed. The silence lengthened out. I stretched my sore limbs and stared around me at the trees, and so suddenly that it seemed to jump out of the green tracery about it, my eyes lit upon a black face watching me. You, he said. In the boat. He was a man then, at least as much of a man as Montgomery's attendant, for he could talk. Yes, I said, I came in the boat, from the ship. Oh, he said, and his bright, restless eyes travelled over me. I say, said I, where can I get something to eat? Eat, he said, eat man's food. Now, at the hut's. He set off at a quick walk. Come along, said he. The creature was little better than an idiot. I tried him with some questions, but his chattering responses were as often as not quite at cross-purposes, others quite parrot-like. Our path coiled down into a ravine. Its walls grew steep and approached each other. My conductor stopped suddenly. Home, said he. The place was a gloomy passage between high walls of lava. On either side, interwoven heaps of sea mat, palm fans and reeds leaning against the rock, formed rough and impenetrably dark dens. My ape-man reappeared at the aperture of the nearest of these dens, and beckoned me in. In the darkest corner of the hut sat a shapeless mass that grunted as I came in. My ape-man held out a split coconut to me as I crawled into the other corner and squatted down. I took it and began gnawing it. The voice from the dark spoke. He comes to live with us. It was a thick voice with a kind of whistling overtone. He must learn the law. Not to go on all fours. That is the law. Say the words, said the ape-man repeating, and figures at the doorway echoed this with a threat in their voices. Not to suck up drink. That is the law, are we not men? Not to eat fish or flesh, that is the law, are we not men? Not to claw the bark of trees, that is the law, are we not men? We ran through a long list of prohibitions, and then the chant swung round to a new formula. His is the house of pain, his is the hand that makes, his is the hand that wounds, his is the hand that heals. At last, the song ended. My eyes being now accustomed to the darkness, I saw more distinctly the figure in the corner from which the voice came. It was the size of a man, but covered with dull grey hair. I am the sayer of the law, said the grey figure. Here come all that be new to learn the law. I sit in the darkness and say the law. It is even so, said one of the beasts in the doorway. Evil are the punishments of those who break the law. None escape. None escape, said the beast folk, glancing furtively at one another. Punishment is sharp and sure. Therefore learn the law. Say the words. And incontinently he began again the strange litany of the law. And again I and all these creatures began singing and swaying. Then I heard the yelp of a staghound. In another moment I was standing outside the hovel, every muscle of me quivering. Before me were the clumsy backs of perhaps a score of these beast people, their misshapen heads half hidden by their shoulder blades. Looking in the direction in which they faced, I saw coming through the haze the figure of Moreau, he was holding the leaping staghound back, and close behind him came Montgomery, revolver in hand. I looked round, and saw to the right of me a narrow gap in the wall of rock. Stop! 
cried Moreau, as I strode towards this, and then... Hold him! First one face turned towards me, and then others. But their bestial minds were happily slow. I dashed my shoulder into one clumsy monster, and flung him forward into another. I felt his hands fly round, clutching at me and missing me. In another minute... I was scrambling up a steep side pathway, out of the ravine. I ran down a steep slope, and came to a low-lying stretch of tall reeds, through which I pushed into a dark, thick undergrowth. The air behind me and about me was soon full of threatening cries. I fell on my forearms and head among thorns and rose with a torn ear and bleeding face. I had fallen into a precipitous ravine, rocky and thorny, full of a hazy mist and with a hot streamlet meandering down towards the sea. The stream broadened out to a shallow, weedy sand in which an abundance of crabs started from my footfall. I walked to the very edge of the salt water. Far in front of me, I saw first one and then several figures emerging from the bushes. Moreau, with his grey staghound, then Montgomery, and two others. They began gesticulating and advancing. The two beastmen came running forward to cut me off from the route inland. Turning seaward, I walked straight into the water. It was shallow at first. I was thirty yards out before the waves reached my waist. "'What are you doing, man?' cried Montgomery. What am I doing? I'm going to drown myself, said I. Montgomery and Moreau looked at each other. Why? asked Moreau. Because that is better than being tortured by you. What makes you think I shall torture you? asked Moreau. Up the beach were Maling, Montgomery's attendant, and one of the white swathed brutes from the boat, and behind him some other dim figures. "'Who are these creatures?' said I, pointing to them and raising my voice so that it might reach them. "'They were men, men like yourselves, whom you have infected with some bestial taint, "'men whom you have enslaved and whom you still fear.' "'You who listen!' I cried, pointing now to Moreau and shouting past him to the beast men. "'Do you not see these men go in dread of you? "'Why then do you fear them? You are many!' For God's sake, cried Montgomery, stop that, Prendick! Prendick! cried Moreau. I went on shouting, I scarcely remember what. That Moreau and Montgomery could be killed, that they were not to be feared, that was the burden of what I put into the heads of the beast people. At last, for want of breath, I paused. Listen to me for a moment, said the steady voice of Moreau. In the first place, I never asked you to come upon this island. If we vivisected men, we should import men, not beasts. In the next, we had you drugged last night, had we wanted to work you any mischief. We have chased you for your good. Besides, why should we want to shoot you when you have just offered to drown yourself? But I saw, said I, in the enclosure, that was the puma. Look here, Prendick, said Montgomery. You're a silly ass. Come out of the water and talk. Go up the beach first, said I, after thinking. Both turned and faced the six or seven grotesque creatures who stood there in the sunlight, casting shadows and yet so incredibly unreal. Montgomery cracked his whip at them, and they fled helter-skelter into the trees. When Montgomery and Moreau were at a distance I judged sufficient, I waded ashore. That's better, said Moreau, without affectation. As it is, you have wasted the best part of my day with your confounded imagination. And with a touch of contempt that humiliated me, he and Montgomery turned and went on in silence before me. The knot of beast men stood back among the trees, they may once have been animals, but I never before saw an animal trying to think. <laughs>